hello, good afternoon, or hello, good, have a good day and a warm welcome from my side to this uh, second chapter in the lecture series on mutations. It's a lecture by Heather Davis from uh, New York from the New School, and the title is The Queer Futurity of Plastic. Uh, this lecture series was um, curated or is curated by the fellows of the Mutations program. My name is Elke Ostimora. I'm the director of Akademie Schloss Solitude, which is an international and transdisciplinary artist in residence program in Stuttgart, in Germany, in the southwest of Germany. The new transdisciplinary program on the topic of mutation is a cooperation between the Akademie Schloss Solitude and the KFW Foundation in Frankfurt. Uh, it invites uh, seven international artists, researchers, and also creative thinkers to engage with the topic of mutation through immersive labs and discussions. And let me shortly introduce the group of the researchers, the fellows. And first, I would like to introduce you to Angela Anderson, who will moderate uh, the night, the, the, the evening, and will also introduce you to the work of uh, Heather Davis. Hello, Angela. Hello. Uh, she's a video artist and also a researcher. And then I would like to introduce you to Sabina Ho Yu a media and sound artist. Hello. And Grayson Earl, a new media artist uh, from the US. Ana Maria Gomez Lopez, an artist, writer, and researcher. Clara Joe, a video artist. And Maxwell Mutanda, very multidisciplinary researcher, visual artist, and designer. And Joanna Quiroga, a visual artist and philosopher from Brazil. And now I would I also would like to welcome Rose, our host, more or less. Rose Field is a young curator who is coordinating the entire program. And now I would like to give the floor to Daniela Leikam from the KFW Foundation or Stiftung in German from Frankfurt. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Elke. Um, and a warm welcome again for the second time also from my side. How exciting that we get to start the second edition of the lecture series Mutation, which is really just one of several platforms that this group of fellows is currently working on as part of their collaboration, their discussions, um, their interaction with each other. We're really happy to open this to the public and we'd like to encourage all you in front of your screens to share your thoughts, um, ask away your questions as we go through the lecture. In the end, there will be time for Q&A and Angela will moderate through the evening. Um, last week, uh, Joanne Kuchara Morin took us on a little spin, um, introducing us to the Allosphere. The lecture is available online. Please check all channels by the Academy Schloss Solitude and the Foundation. Um, there's YouTube and Vimeo available. And um, we will put all lectures online as we proceed with the lecture series. Um, so I'm very thrilled to now have the honor to welcome and um, introduce Heather Davis really quickly. Um, you are so renowned for your work within the Anthropocene and many other fields. Um, I will keep this very short. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, thank you to the group of fellows and all partners to Rose as always. And I'll pass on the word to Angela who will now guide us through the evening and the discussion and in welcome and introduce Heather Davis to all of us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elka and Daniela. Uh, thank you very much for making the program possible. Um, it's very exciting to be able to put on this lecture series. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many people with us here tonight. And I look forward to our discussion afterwards uh, already. Um, I remember the first time I encountered Heather's work, I was very excited um, that somebody was working on plastic uh, because despite its ubiquitous and pervasive presence in our lives um, and the massive role that plastic plays in environmental contamination, 
there seems to be kind of a lack of critical discourse on plastic. Like it's not quite as sexy as oil, I think. Um, but also in particular, the relationship between humans and plastic and sort of digging deeper into the subsurface levels of this relationship. Um, and on this note, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Heather Davis. She's an assistant professor of culture and media at the New School and is also the co-editor of the books, Art in the Anthropocene, Encounters Among Aesthetics, Politics and Environments, as well as Epistemologies and Desire Change, Contemporary Feminist Art in Canada. And her current book project, Plastic Matter, which re-examines materiality in relation to plastic, will be out next spring on Duke University Press. Uh, she's also a member of the Synthetic Collective, which is an interdisciplinary team of scientists, humanities scholars, and artists who investigate and make visible plastic pollution in the Great Lakes, um, which I very much appreciate as someone who comes from Wisconsin, which borders one of the Great Lakes. And uh, after Heather's talk, there will be a Q&A where you are all invited to ask questions. Uh, you can either write your questions into the Q&A function uh, or you can raise your hand by the little raise hand button down below on the bar and uh, ask your question sort of uh, in real life. Uh, we're going to record this session and it will be available later on the Mutations Group website. So just keep that in mind when you're asking your questions in person. Uh, and before I pass the word on to Heather, I'd just like to mention that the next lecture in the Mutation series will be Eben Kierksey, uh, moderated by my colleague Grayson Earl, on Wednesday, April 7th at 12 noon, Berlin, Stuttgart time. So just as a reminder for everybody, don't miss that one. And Heather, uh, with no further ado, uh, the stage is yours. Um, well, thanks so much, um, Angela, for the invitation and that um, kind um, introduction. Um, and thank you so much everyone for, for being here um, and um, to um, Elke and, and Daniela for, for providing this platform and um, Rose for organizing. Um, just a quick note about, I, I normally am in New York right now, I'm in um, Montreal, which is um, actually called Jajaga. And it's situated on the traditional territory of uh, the Ganayaga, um, a place which has long served as a meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganayaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabek um, peoples. Um, and I say this um, as a kind of reminder to myself um, and uh, to the um, kind of broader community to hold me accountable for the kind of ongoing work of decolonization. Um, the um, my interests in plastic are wide ranging, um, but one of the one of the the, the real sort of central um, issues that um, that Angela already talked sort of touched upon um, is this question of extraction. So I'm not going to talk so much about that um, this evening, but it's certainly um, in the background of my thinking at all times. Um, so. Um, I've, you know, I've been obsessed with plastic for, I, I guess, about the past um, 10 years, sort of really working on this um, research project um, around plastic. Um, and I'm going to only um, present just kind of a little section of it to you tonight. Um, but, um, but one of the things that I think is important um, to sort of situate myself in relationship to this project and some one of my primary entry points and one of the ways in which I've been thinking about it um, is uh, through my grandparents. So this is actually um, a picture of my grandmother. I know that um, she looks like um, a magazine model here um, in her perfect um, 1950s kitchen. Um, but I show this picture to you not just because uh, I think it's a great photo, um, but because um, my grandfather was um, a chem chemical engineer at DuPont Canada um, for his entire life. And so, um, and there he was really responsible for um, uh, both management, but also uh, was heavily involved in the development of synthetic textiles, which I personally would classify as um, a type of plastic. So 
um, and I wouldn't be alone in that in that characterization. So, so I want to I highlight this because one of the ways in which I've been really thinking about plastics are the ways in which um, we can think about it along the lines of inheritance. Um, and so, in this case, there's a kind of direct inheritance of plastics um, to my life. The ways in which it is structured. Um, a certain kinds of access to power and privilege that I have, certain kinds of cons consolidations of wealth. Um, and also with that really understanding the ways in which toxicity, I think is one of the ways in which um, a consolidations of power and privilege happen um, on a bodily level. Um, and the other thing that I am um, sort of, I'm always thinking about in relationship to um, plastic and its inheritance is the kind of very long, long-term scales um, that of plastic that I think we're all pretty aware of at this point in time. Um, the fact that it, it really isn't um, going away, um, it's permeated every place on earth, and it's um, basically impossible to kind of clean up, right? So I think along the lines of, of other um, environmental problems that, that are um, extremely large and there's kind of no, no return, um, Plastic is yet another one of these examples. Um, and one of the reasons, another one of the reasons why I've been so fascinated with plastic for all these years, um, like Angela was also pointing to, is that I think that for me, one of the things about plastic is that it really is this kind of intimate um, manifestation of how oil appears in our lives. So unlike um, the kind of more abstract infrastructures of pipelines or, um, a, you know, the gas pump is probably the closest that we ever get as consumers um, directly to oil. Um, uh, you know, unless you're involved in, in production or, or some other place, plastic is a way in which um, oil actually saturates all of our relations. Um, so in that sense, um, it's the inheritance of everybody um, and all the, all the, by everybody, I mean, not just humans, but all of the beings. Um, and the question is, how is it differentially affecting us? And um, and how, what do we sort of do with this state of affairs? Um, so I've been really interested in kind of following plastic um, and following the ways in which it has um, appeared in all of these different forms. Um, and one of the things I want to suggest, um, even if I'm really thinking about this in relationship to, um, to the question of inheritance is that I don't think that these are necessarily linear frameworks. Um, so I'll get into that. Um, in, a, in a moment. Um, but the other thing I think that's important for me and my research around plastic um, is really thinking about what do we do? Um, how do we think about a methodological framework? Um, and I really take this from a kind of feminist methodology. How do we think about a methodological framework that instead of asking for a critical distance from objects that we might abjure, or in my case, objects that have structurally, um, that, that that have contributed largely to the structural conditions of my life, um, but that we might uh, we might want to distance ourselves from, right? So, like, so in my case, instead of sort of thinking about to trying to distance myself from my um, from my inheritance um, in relationship to plastic, one of the things that's important to me in this project is is actually asking what happens if we get closer to plastic, right? So, what happens if instead of this instead of this impulse to distance ourselves, we actually take this as an invitation um, to get closer to objects um, that we abjure. Um, so um, one of the ways in which I've been uh, thinking about this is along the lines of um, what I'm calling queer kin, um, or in other versions have um, sort of called non-filial human progeny, um, and I'll get to that in one second. Um, but again, I come through, I come at this question through the figure um, of oil. Um, and oil has been proposed as a kind of grand kin. Um, for us um, by a number of um, uh, really amazing um, critical thinkers, including um, Zoe Todd, Michelle Murphy, and Vanessa Agar Jones. Um, and they've all been kind of proposing in various iterations um, what happens if we think about oil as a kind of grandkin. So if we think about oil as a reminder of the ancient life that came before ours, um, that is still a part of us that makes our lives possible through intergenerational knowledge and through a deep embeddedness to our ancestors through evolution. So what if we thought of this material as the kind of reemergence of these deep ancestors? 
Um, so recognizing that these long dead organisms feeling their vibrancy can be an invitation to a profound sense of interconnection with the world. Um, but of course, this is not the type of invitation that we are normally given either in our material relations or in our philosophical um, trajectories for thinking about um, how to interact with oil or what it means in our lives. Um, so, and I think that this is precisely because the kind of violence of the unearthing of these organisms, right? So, um, so as Todd um, writes, she says, to turn the massive stores of carbon and hydrogen left from eons of life weaponize these, these fossil kin, these long dead beings, and transforms them into threats to the narrow conditions of existence, which Blackfoot scholar Leroy Little Bear reminds us we are bound to. So instead of an invitation into an evolutionary and intergenerational um, acknowledgement of the ways in which our lives are made possible through the knowledge and creativity of so many other beings, um, both humans and other than human alike, we have turned these potential grand kin against themselves um, and they appear as specters, all their compressed times um, and stores of energy are unloosed to wreak havoc on the living. Um, so instead of, of, of opening to these lines of connection that might actually be um, you know, a source of, of thinking through the kind of uh, temporal arrangements um, where we are deeply embedded and indebted to um, those who've come before us, um, in this instance, in the in the in the current the, in the current configuration of the ways in which oil appears, um, it's really this unearthing that is a kind of weaponization. Um, and I want to suggest that that plastic um, both embodies this kind of weaponization and the unearthing uh, that comes along with with um, with these relations to uh, these very non consensual relations to oil. Um, and certainly, I think that that uh, really helps to sort of reorient our minds towards questions of environmental justice um, and the ways in which uh, plastic really appears differentially um, along and with differential harms um, for, for people depending on where they're situated along lines of race, class, gender, ability, et cetera. Um, but I also wanna think about um, the other kinds of ways in which plastic has also been appearing. Um, so one of the ways in which I've been arguing and thinking about plastic um, is thinking about it as this kind of queer kin. So what might I mean by this? Um, certainly this is, this is also informed by these um, ideas of the weaponization of um, the oil as kin. Um, but I also want to suggest that, that um, plastic as queer kin is also doing a couple other things as well. Um, so one of the things is that um, um, you may or may, you may or may not have come across uh, this, but um, but plastic uh, is creating all kinds of new life forms. Um, and the thing that you're seeing in front of you um, is a picture of what is called the plastosphere. Um, I believe this article was originally published in 2012. Um, and it talks about the ways in which um, tiny pieces of microplastics that are distributed throughout the ocean that I'm sure you've all heard about, um, all of these are becoming kind of floating rafts of, my, of uh, biodiverse microbial, microbial spaces. Um, and so what might we, how might we think about those as a kind of um, non-filial human progeny? Because they certainly are the, these bacteria that, that um, are being created by way of the kind of transformation of the biosphere through plastic. Um, it certainly um, will, will almost certainly um, uh, outlive, um, if not humans, and at least the current configuration um, that we are in. So, um, so I want to think about these as a kind of children, right? Um, as maybe an, an unintentional children, but a children nonetheless. Um, and um, and I also want to think about the ways in which, simultaneously to that, the other reason why I'm, I'm thinking about plastic as a kind of queer kin um, is because of plastic's reproductive toxicity. So one of the things um, that also uh, has sort of been widely um, disseminated about plastic um, is uh, through um, the plasticizers that are embedded in plastics in order to make them more pliable or pink or heat resistant or whatever um, is necessary for a particular consumer item. Um, many of those, those um, added plasticizers um, are associated with, with certain kinds of endocrine disruption. And I know um, in Europe, um, you all are much better at regulating these types of chemicals than, than we are in North America. Um, but, uh, but 
but this is one of the ways in which we might think about um, the harms of, of plastic is through the fact that it is um, interfering with, um, with endocrine systems, which are partially responsible for um, reproductive capacity, both in humans and in other um, sexually reproducing organisms. Um, another sort of um, way to think about this question of reproductive toxicity um, is the fact that plastic um, has now also been found in human placentas. Um, we have no idea what it's doing there. Um, it might be completely benign. It, um, it might not be, we don't know. Um, but, um, but these are some of the ways in which I'm, I'm trying to bring together these questions of thinking about plastic in relationship to queer kin. So I'll just take um, you know, another 15 minutes or so to talk about that and then we can open it up for questions. So what kind of offspring is plastic and how might it in intersect with questions of queer life and non-reproduction? And in light of our increasingly non-reproductive futures, might there be something to be learned from queer theory and the embodiment of queer subjects that have never assumed biological reproduction to be the ultimate signifier of hope? Um, and I think that this for me is really the ethical turn um, in the midst of this, this is how do we um, begin to imagine um, using um, queer models of life as a kind of basis to reimagine what kinship structures might mean in order to become more accountable um, to the harms um, that, uh, that are being perpetrated through um, materials like plastic. So um, as I mentioned, um, this image is uh, an image of these microplastics, which now um, numerically dominate marine debris and are primarily colonized by microbial and other microscopic life. Um, and the plastosphere, which compromises the microbial community on plastic and debris, um, the authors have argued, um, is that unsettled, that this, uh, that this rivals uh, that of the built environment in spanning multiple biomes on Earth. Um, so these are incredibly important um, new biomes um, to think with, um, and ones that we are not very sure uh, what they are doing. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think has been really important to me when I've been thinking about um, plastic is that when we do describe the kind of projected amount of time um, that uh, plastic may be around for, um, there's a couple of different ways in which we're talking about that. Sometimes we're talking about that in relationship to photo degradation. Sometimes there are ways in which um, plastic seems to break down on its own. Um, but whenever we're talking about something like biodegradation, what we actually mean is a kind of evolutionary movement rather than a chemical progression initiated within the polymers themselves. So in other words, the figure of hundreds or thousands of years, what is sometimes identified as the length of time it would take for plastic to biodegrade is the projected evolutionary time span of or for organisms to proliferate that can successfully metabolize plastic. Um, but it's important to point out that there's actually many organisms that can do this already. So for example, there are two strands of bacteria that have been found in the stomachs of mealworms that can effectively digest ty styrofoam. Waxworms can degrade polyethylene um, and they waxworms evolved to live in beehives and they eat the wax in the beehives so which has a very similar molecular structure so it was pretty easy for them to be able to adapt to be able to um, eat polyethylene the fungus oh I'm not going to say this out loud sorry <laughs> sorry if, if anyone wants to know I can post in the chat later but there's a fungus found in the Amazon that can biodegrade polyurethane under both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And there are no, a number of other fungi have also been identified that can degrade plastics. So in another example um, where the concentrations of plastics are leading to novel organisms, the bacteria um, I, I Diana, the, sorry, this is, I'm gonna, this is also a, a very difficult word for me to say, but there's another, another bacteria which evolved in garbage dumps in Japan um, and was found to use polyethylene um, terephthalate as its major energy source for growth. And in 2018, scientists building upon this knowledge accidentally produced bacteria that can speed up the process of consuming um, polyethylene terephthalate plastic through the enhancement of, of the enzyme PETAs. 
the hope is that these enzymes can be harnessed to biodegrade plastic, though there is some, also some concern that they could significantly degrade our existing materials and infrastructures um, if let loose into the wider environment. So the proliferation, I, I go through all these examples because I wanna show that, that this kind of process of biodegradation is actually already starting to occur um, about 120 years after the, um, the original um, manufacture of a fully synthetic plastic. So the proliferation of plastic is pushing evolution to develop novel ways of dealing with this incredibly rich material. Microbial and human genealogies are becoming further entangled, even as the consequences of this evolutionary collaboration are unknown. We can, following Myra Heard, think of these new bacteria and fungi as indifferent symbiogenic genetic organisms feeding off of capitalism's excess, proliferating and flourishing in our miasmic plastic soups created out of the unregulated advancements of chemical engineering. But we can also think about these, um, these new um, bacteria and fungi as a kind of human descendant, a new type of offspring dissociated from the heteronormative biological imperative of reproduction as the production of sameness. Um, so although this analysis is very much a departure from traditional understandings of kinship systems that are tracked through genetics, biology, or as in the definition give by, um, given by Claude uh, Lévi-Strauss, forged within practices of exchange, I would like to propose these bacteria as our queer kin, once constituted through an extension of the human habitus. The widespread use of plastics and the responsive capacities of bacteria are a form, albeit capacious, of renewed relationships that Elizabeth Freeman defines as the mechanism of queer kinship. So these renewed relationships between humans and plastics may not have the same kinds of reciprocal care that is expected from other kinds of familial bonds, but they do express the ways in which petrocapitalist subjects return again and again to ways of life that generate and proliferate plastic. And in a sense, maybe they do exhibit care for us by flourishing off our waste. Um, so whether we, the inheritors of plastic now or in the future, will care for them and how um, is an open question. So one of the other um, things that's sort of animating my thinking around the question of um, bacteria as queer kin, these, these bacteria that are evolving in relationship to plastic um, as a kind of queer kin, is that um, one of the ways uh, in which um, environmental movements often get figured um, is really through highlighting um, an anxiety over proper heteronormative reproductivity. Um, and of course, this also, um, this kind of figure of the proper heteronormative reproductivity is also a highly racialized um, figure. Um, and we can see this anxiety reproduced throughout environmental movements where um, the child often stands in for the future, right? So anybody who's ever been to an extinction rebellion um, or any other um, protest in relationship to climate change is always, um, you always see these posters. Um, and just to sort of highlight um, one, one aspect of this, um, in an extract from This Changes Everything um, by, by Naomi Klein, um, she talks about this relationship um, to her child where, where he's particularly enamored um, with a moose um, and um, she's worried that he's never gonna, uh, maybe never gonna see a moose. Um, and you can, you can see these kinds of figures of the kind of investment in the future always being animated by this, uh, by this reproductive futurity, by this relationship to a proper heteronormative um, reproduction, biological reproduction um, that Lee Edelman and other queer, um, queer um, theorists would also argue, argue is a reproduction of the same systems of domination um, that we also have in place. So, so um, you know, and you can also see this through, through um, some versions of an environmental movement that are not really calling for us to, um, to change the way that we live or the ways that we're structuring things, um, but are rather kind of saying, oh no, we can just switch to, switch to a green economy and everything will be fine, right? Um, I don't mean to totally lump Naomi Klein into that, but I, um, I do think that um, that um, part of what um, she ends up talking about in this section of her book um, is um, uh, betrays some of these anxieties around the questions of um, the singular heteronormative 
uh, reproductive uh, futurity. Um, but then something stranger happens within Klein's texts. Um, she proceeds to narrate her reproductive problems. She's had multiple miscarriages before a successful pregnancy, coupled with her experiences covering the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, her, she then provocatively moves away from her own concerns about biological reproduction and the figure of the child to a moment of trans-species empathy or bonding. So I'm just gonna um, quote her. She says, spring is the start of spawning season on the Gulf Coast and Henderson knew these marshes were teeming with nearly invisible zooplankton and tiny juveniles that would develop into adult shrimp, oysters, crabs, and fin fish. In these fragile weeks, the marsh grass acts as an aquatic incubator, providing nutrients and protection from predators. Everything is born in these wetlands, he said. The prospects for these microscopic creatures do not look good. Each wave brought in more oil and dispersants, sending levels of carcinogenic polycyclic aromic hydrocarbons soaring. And this was all happening at the worst possible moment in the biological calendar. Not only shellfish, but also bluefin tuna, grouper, snapper, mackerel, marlin, and swordfish were all spawning. Out in the open water, floating clouds of translucent proto-life were just waiting for one of the countless plumes of oil and dispersants to pass through them like an angel of death. And a certain species of larva was in the process of being snuffed out. We would likely not find out about it for years. And then ra rather than some camera ready mass die off, there would be nothing, an absence, a hole in the life cycle. It was then that I let go of the idea that infertility made me some sort of exile from nature and began to feel what I can only describe as a kinship with the infertile. So that, that's the, the end of the quote from her. So although the figure of the child operates at the heart of this section of the book, as the literal embodiment of hope for the future, and as well as the particular kind of environmental guilt, um, Klein's description of slow violence of suffering marked not by some spectacular event, but, my, but more ominously by an absence, a whole, opens up a queer ecological imagination. Mirroring her own problems with fertility, she invokes a queer futurity that is marked by trans species empathy and identification. The kinship with the infertile that Klein notes might be the beginnings of a queering of social reproduction that would allow a different kind of narration to enter into the massive extinctions currently happening, one less focused on individual reproductive capacity and oriented instead towards love and care that extends outwards beyond one, one's immediate biological family and potentially beyond one's species. It offers a moment to rethink how kinship is form and opportunity to care for those beings already in the world, even if outside of normative family units. Um, I would also say that I think that thinking with bacteria is actually um, an especially fertile ground for rethinking these questions of Norman of family Unix and the questions of reproduction. So in many ways, the fact that plastic is leading to evolutionary shifts in bacteria points to the vitality and cre creativity of life itself. And certainly in the realm of gender and sex, it might be quite instructive for humans to learn from bacteria, especially in relation to queer forms of life. If bacteria were understood as queer kin, the plurality of forms of sex, reproduction, and gender that bacteria embody, which I think are in the thousands, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, didn't mark it down here, but it's, it's really some astronomical um, number of, of um, sort of sex, gender, and, and reproductive capacities um, uh, that bacteria embody could metaphorically provide new forms of social organization for humans as our bodies increasingly morph into queer formations. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, the ways in which certain forms of chemical toxicity are literally shifting um, the ways in which human bodies are appearing um, and, and um, in the process are becoming um, more queer. So bacterial progeny of plastic create new organisms to understand metaphorically and materially the potential relations of sex and reproduction beyond um, sexual difference. Um, so petrochemical relations then could be thought of as an intimate tying through of lines of descent. Sorry, I'll just change the slides to do something else to look at. Um, of lines of descent extended and enhanced through the durability of plastic and the evolutionary emergence of new forms of bacteria. 
So we can also think here about the ways in which this understanding of kinship also helps to open up our bodies and our understanding of ourselves as bounded organisms um, to really think about our interrelationship and enmeshment with bacteria, challenging the bounds of the normatively figured and bounded body, which I think is one of the kind of fantasies of where plastic comes from, this desire for containment, this desire for boundedness. Um, while opening up questions of inheritance beyond the confines of property genetics and patriarchal filial norms. So to acknowledge that the future will be queer in a sense of completely disruptive um, means finding a way also of living with, with these toxicities. So, you know, in this talk, I think I've, you know, I've highlighted some of maybe the more interesting or novel um, ways in which, um, ways in which, um, but, uh, queer um, sort of ways in which bacteria are kind of participating in this kind of queer futurity. Um, but I think we also need to simultaneously acknowledge the ways in which um, this, this kind of rapid proliferation of toxicity throughout the world um, is also obviously extremely harmful. Um, but I think that embracing the strange alliances and ambivalences of queerness and petrochemicals may allow for new types of analysis for um, what Mel Chen would say is a queer knowledge production that gives some means for structural remedy while not abandoning a claim to being just a little bit off. So the lessons of queer social structures, of families not based on biology, and lives not necessarily afforded protection from the state or other institutions of power might be instructive in facing both our non-filial human progeny and a world filled with increasing uncertainty. So thinking through the ethics of the future and the futures that are already present requires this kind of lateral connection. Instead of biological children, plasticides, microbial progeny will offer a decidedly queer world, one that is birthed from the violence of our present moment. Um, and I'm just gonna end with this um, quote from Alexis Pauline Gums um, from her M archive, um, which I think gets um, at uh, a lot of these questions, but I think maybe I will stop talking and, and maybe just let folks um, read it on their own so that we can open this up to discussion. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm sorry, it's just reading the quote. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have just read it, sorry. <laughs> no, but that's, it's really great. So um, before I would start to ask anything, I just would like to see if we have anyone from our viewers who would like to ask a question. Um, please feel free to raise your hand or write something into either the chat window or the Q&A. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate if there's anything that was just confusing or um, connections that maybe, um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to elaborate on anything, anything that I touched on. We just have one question that showed up into the Q&A, um, so I'll go ahead and read it uh, from Juan Pablo. Um, he writes, or they write, I'm currently working on a mythological web project project, web project, based on Eurythenes pasticus, the amphiphod found at the deepest region of the ocean. Oh my goodness, I hope I can <laughs> read this correctly. Uh, the Mariana <laughs> Trenches, by a group of scientists at the beginning of 2020, who had a plastic microfiber, oh, that had a plastic microfiber in their stomach. Your talk makes me think of, of which humans is the Eurythenes plastic Plasticus related to the dead bodies of enslaved peoples laying at the, at the ocean floor who had lived amongst plastic trash for centuries. In that context, what do you think about the emergence of these species being named after plastic and the tension they point at between embracing the hybridity of contamination versus rejecting the necropolitics of plastics? How can we do both at the same time taking into account those for whom plastic is not an evolutionary asset, but a direct existential threat. 
Yeah, I think that that's um, an amazing question. I feel like you um, have kind of read my mind in terms of um, in terms of the overall project. Um, so maybe like I like I said earlier, what I was presenting here today is maybe it's sort of the more um, optimistic um, side of things. Um, but I think that um, so I think that a couple of things. One for me, one of the things that I find advantageous of thinking about queer theory, and I don't know if you read. Um, Mel Chen's book on animacy, but I would really highly recommend it if you're sort of interested in those interconnections. Um, because one of the things that I find so generative about their thinking um, is that they they don't, um, but they don't in any way, shape, or form sort of deny the kind of necropolitical aspects of of plastic, right? Um, there is no way to sort of say that it isn't um, a material that is deeply embedded in environmental racism, that is a proliferation and amplification of the kind of privilege and power of, of whiteness and white supremacy, um, of the ways in which it's deeply embedded in structures of colonialism. Um, all of those things are, are completely true. I think that one of the things that, um, that, um, that you're, like that that um I also think is like the so the question is like so what do we do with this and I think that um for me um positioned as a white settler one of the things that I think that um that I have been finding really um inspiring about thinking along the lines of toxicities um and especially thinking um really being inspired by um, Mel Chen's work and others um also Michelle Murphy's work and Vanessa Agar Jones's work um, is uh, is really thinking about, um, and obviously also this um, a beautiful book by um, Alexis Pauline Gums, um, is really thinking about the ways in which um, toxicity needs to be thought in a kind of plurality of ways, um, in part because it's not going away. And the reason why I say that is also because of that I think that part of the harms that has been caused over the, especially in relationship to plastic, part of the harms that have been caused is in this in this in this kind of white fantasy of barricade, right? So that so that there is this real fantasy within the white imagination um, that we can somehow barricade ourselves off from the outside world, right? That like that all of the harms that we exert outside of us will somehow not come back to haunt us, which is you know factually totally untrue, um, but in a certain way has been um, true-ish, right? Because we've been able to, and when I say we here, I mean white people, um, have been able to move that toxicity um, so that other bodies are the bodies who are having to absorb that toxicity, right? And on in Turtle Island, where I live, you know, it's primarily Black and Indigenous people. Um, and so I think that um, I think that there needs to be an accounting for that, but I also think that like the fantasy of going back into a state of barricading is one that we absolutely need to avoid. So I think that um, for, for people like me, I think that there's a certain way in which there's a necessary embrace of certain kinds of toxicities, both because that is just actually the world in which we live, um, but also because of the ways in which um, the fantasy of, of of, of somehow assuming this kind of immunity or purity, I think is such a deeply harmful fantasy um, that, we, that we need to be able to um, hold those things simultaneously together. But I would actually like absolutely love to, to hear your thoughts more. And um, you know, if you want to write to me or tell me more about the project, I would, I would really love to hear more about it. It sounds like we're thinking very similar things. One, I guess if you have something you'd like to add, you can type that into the Q&A. Um, we have two people who've raised their hands, so I think we'll take these questions next, and then there's another one in the typed in the Q&A. So, uh, Jonna, do, would you like to uh, ask a question? Uh, I think you are muted. Um, unmute. Uh, I don't know, John, if you hear me, you might have to unmute your microphone. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what's quite, I can't seem to unmute. Okay, um, maybe uh, we can move on to Giovanni. Could you try? Uh, it's... Test, test, can you hear me? Ah, yes. 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 Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, 
So thank you um, for this fantastic talk. I mean, it's um, very intriguing, many, many thoughts that are coming up in my mind. I like the, the non-filial human progeny uh, idea. What is unclear to me, uh, and maybe if, if you could help me there, is this a pessimistic or an optimistic <laughs> view? And, um, and, and let me explain a little bit better what, what I mean. So. If, if we take it optimistically, then uh, I could read your talk as saying, well, there are these bacteria, we have this non-filial human progeny, we create new uh, forms of life that belong um, and, and, and belong in, in also a positive way. Now in biology, you could say, well, we have created a new ecological niche where this, this new life comes in. Uh, and, and there I would like to ask this question. I mean, many uh, species, uh, plants, uh, animals create ecological niches. Nature doesn't have ecological niches there that are filled, they are created. Say a cow creates a new ecological niche uh, to then digest uh, grass, right? And creates new forms of bacteria that live in the cow to digest the, the grass. So are these new forms of bacteria that a cow creates in ecology, are they the non-filial cow progeny? Would that be within your picture of, of how a, a coordinated evolution between different species uh, can be described? This is a great thought. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I, I would, I would go with that. <laughs> cool. Um, Do you want me to also talk about the optimistic pessimistic thing, or should we just, should we should we move on, Angela? Um, if you have something you would like to say, um, go for it. Yeah, I can maybe just say something briefly. Um, so, like, I guess you know, like, um, I, I, that, that was a great question. I didn't anticipate where you were going, um, but um, but I, I um, like in relationship to the kind of question of optimistic versus pessimistic, I think that I'm actually trying to charge something else. And the reason why I say that is because I think in the optimistic sense of, of, of the ways in which our culture currently operates, um, there's this kind of techno utopianism um, where we are often encouraged to believe that um, technologies are really gonna save us, right? So the ways in which the PE, um, PETAs um, bacteria is gonna save us from, from plastic pollution, for example, right? And one of the things that, that I argue um, in, the long, in, in the book is that actually plastic um, really betrays this orientation to matter where we think that matter is endlessly manipulable. And what I mean by that is not that, not that there isn't a kind of um, inherent creativity to matter itself, right? Clearly, like in the example that you described about the bacteria that can eat the grass in the cow's stomach, um, that, is, that is the creativity of, um, of, of matter, the kind of column response of, of evolutionary processes. The kind of symbiosis that, um, or symbiogenesis that somebody like um, that Margulis would, Lynn Margulis would talk about, right? Um, but um, but the ways in which it's been harnessed in our current world is has really been um, very destructive because I think it's been a real imposition on matter. So like the ways in which um, we can think about the unearthing of oil as being this extremely violent kind of act, right? Um, of of kind of like ripping something out of the ground. Um, or you know, in other kinds of extraction processes, um, and that that kind of version of the optimistic techno utopianism, I really can't get on board with. Um, similarly, um, I think sometimes within critical theory, um, or you know, on the left in general, there's this kind of nihilistic apocalypse, apocalypse uh, or this tendency towards a kind of nihilistic apocalypse, right? Where it's like, oh well, you know, we're all screwed, so why bother trying, right? Um, let's just save ourselves. And I think that that's also an ethically untenable position. So I think like I'm trying to chart some kind of path um, between those things, but I love the, um, I'm definitely gonna think more about the cow bacteria. So thank you for that. Thank you. So we have several more questions. Um, I'll take this one first from the chat and then um, I will go where Maxwell can ask your question in real life. Um, so the first one from the chat is uh, Sasha Eng Engelman. Uh, from Art in the Anthropocene. Uh, 
Uh, and she writes, I love your talk and wondered, uh, following Vanessa Agar Jones in What the Sands Remember, if we can also think of the bacteria and fungi progeny mentioned in your talk as embodying a kind of, quote, memory, or perhaps queer memory of the chemical extractive industries that have produced plastics. Also curious about where memory might interface with your notion of inheritance. Yeah, hi Sasha, nice to um, see, 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 see a kind of virtual presence. Um, but um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's also something that I take up in this sort of longer, um, longer version of this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think memory is actually a really complicated and interesting thing. One of the things I didn't mention in this talk um, that obviously, um, actually I can't remember if, if, um, if Edgar Jones talks about this, but one of the things that, that's, that happens in relationship to a lot of the toxins um, that are associated with a lot of the petrochemical toxins is that they also skip generations. So you can um, say there's a pregnant person that person, if if they um, are um, carrying a fetus that um, that itself is um, is producing eggs, the the chemicals that the that the that the grandparent is being exposed to will actually affect the child born two generations later. So you know, Michelle Murphy talks about this in terms of latency, um, but I think that also we can think about this as a kind of embodied memory, right? So like the ways in which um, memory is kind of going forward and back in time. Um, and also thinking about the ways in which, like, if we're going to seriously think about um, plastic um, as a kind of grandkin, then, then obviously we also have to think about the ways in which um, that kind of compressed time that is oil is also compressed memories of what the earth has been. Um, but then it's also being released and then, then it's going to last for, for so long into the future. So, um, so I think that one of the things that, that it really opens up is this, um, is this way in which, um, uh, is this kind of a, maybe a kind of um, non-linear memory, a way in which memory can go forward and backwards in time um, where plastic becomes a kind of vector um, through, through these various kinds of time sp timescapes. But I also think that um, one of the things that's really important about um, plastic is that it's designed in order to um, sever some of those memories so that in the, in its production is designed to move out of an ecological niche and to be this kind of um, universal uh, synthetic object um, and but of course then it gets re-embedded um, in 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 a kind of memory structure as it's unfolded back into the earth so i think there's a lot of really interesting and complicated um, things happening in relationship to memory and plastic thank you um, Maxwell. You have to. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much, um, Heather. That was amazing. It was really, really exciting. I think for me, one of the things um, that was on my mind was this idea of the politics of space. Um, like really the sexual politics of space, thinking mm. of it from a queer perspective. Um, like I'm looking at say, Berlant and Warner's Sex and Public and how um, the sort of heteronormative uh, dominance didn't have room for queer space. Um, I really appreciated your, your point on this sort of techno optimism um, because also within uh, technology, I think not enough has said about um, data as an extractive process that in a way replicates, um, in a way, colonial and settler practices. Um, but specifically, I think one of the things I, I wanted to know was, you know, if you had any further thoughts on how this idea of this the ubiquity of plastics right as this kind of uh epitome of western namely white heteronormative dominant domestic achievement has also set in motion a new kind of queer future uh at this of planetary adaption 
right? Um, that requires us to then change our own notions of domesticity, how we live and, and occupy space. Um, yeah, uh, it's sort of similar, it, it, I don't know, similarly in, in, in line to what Giovanni was saying with regards to is this pessimistic or optimistic or, or an optimistic view, I think it's, 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 it's it's kind of both and outside and within, um, but really it's a, it's a challenge for me, right? If when I, as a person who looks at, at space um, and the way we sort of have to adapt our, our use of um, the urban or the rural um, and what the urban and the rural has become within um, the Anthropocene. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's like an excellent set of questions. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I think that, um, yeah, in regards to space, there's like, there's lots of, um, there's some really amazing, interesting scholarship at the sort of intersection of, of queer ecologies um, around questions of space and um, specifically kind of toxic spaces as being, um, you know, spaces where, um, or you know woods or whatever as like cruising cruising mm. spaces or you know things like that right so I think that there's some really interesting um, affordances for you know like abandoned space for example as like space that that queer folks can go hang out in um, I think that there's like yeah and, and the kind of refashioning of of those kinds of public spaces um, um, and certainly like Catherine Sandyland's work is is really important in that area. Um, but I was, yeah, I was, as you're talking, I think that also you're getting at something that's like super important about plastic, which is it's, it's complete ubiquity. I mean, you know, um, as Giovanni was saying, you know, it's, it's in the, um, in the Mariana Trench, it's in our placentas, it's in, um, it's in outer space, it's in the Pyrenees, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's literally just everywhere. Um, and this kind of, massive distribution of of something um, is I think a real um, testament to the ways in which um, that kind of project of of thinking uh, the kind of dangers of that project of thinking of, of um, uh, willfully trying to believe that we are bounded that our toxicities can be bounded um, is just blatantly false, right? I think that that's one of the things that, mm. that is becoming super obvious. Mm. Um, and then I think the other thing about that is that um, it really does betray this orientation to matter that that we can we can somehow manipulate it all um, in this kind of willful way, um, and that that is a desirable project, right? So you can see, um, you know, and Bernadette um, Benson Vincent talks really beautifully about this. Um, and she talks about the ways in which, um, you know, plastic um, is one of the first times you get uh, the emergence of form and matter um, simultaneously. So, you know, up until that moment um, in time, you know, people who, when you're working with materials, you have to work within, within pre-given um, pre sets of parameters, right? Like wood will only do certain things, certain yeah. metals will only do certain things. You can melt them, you can mold them, you can shape them, but there's a certain kind of, um, there's a certain structure to the form itself that is dictated by what that matter is. And the thing about plastic is it's one of the very first instances of material engineering. Um, and so it's one of the first instances where we can create form and matter simultaneously. And admittedly, we don't actually do a great job of this. It's like, it's, it's not, um, <laughs> we're not super good at it as of, as of yet, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's this instance where there's this break in a relationship between um, between form and matter that has previously existed, and I think that that um, exploded onto a kind of world scale is is part of what we're seeing right now. Um, and I think there's also you know connections to be made um, to other other kinds of materials or other kinds of engineering processes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts so generously. Thank you, Maxwell, for that wonderful question. So we have more questions. I hope that I hope that you can you don't mind. Um, yes. No, I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> but I realize if folks have to go, I totally understand. Right. So this one is from the chat um, from Anna Hofner, and who says, "Thanks for your wonderful talk. Would you say that queer kin has the potential to shake present-day economic institutions, 
through or even beyond heteronormative reproduction. Can you say more about this anti-capitalist dimension of queer kin that you described? How would that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I think, the real answer to that question. <laughs> um, I think that, like, and I think the reason why I'm saying that is because well, okay, so this would be sort of the positive answer to that question, and I'm not 100% sure this is actually true, but like just as a kind of thought experiment, I'll, I'll go along, go, come along with me for a second, which is like, which is that the positive answer to that question would be the ways in which I could see something like that happening would be if we were to really honestly take these organisms as a kind of queer kin to which we actually had senses of obligation and a kind of reciprocal care towards, then I do think that if we're oriented, not just to these beings, but to beings in general like that, um, that we actually cannot have capitalism in the ways in which it currently appears. You, I don't think you can, I don't think you can have real honest um, reciprocal um, relations of care um, towards other beings um, and have this kind of massive extraction um, or this you know, massive system of capital accumulation this kind of understanding of the constancy of surplus, for example, which is essential to capitalist production. I don't think that you can, you can't have that, right? Because you can't have um, something just operating as like, you know, what Heidegger would call a standing reserve, right? Like that's, that is, that is not possible if you take this kind of epistemology seriously. Um, so I think that that would be, that, that, that's my answer. That's a, it, that's a very positive answer. <laughs> it's a very optimistic answer. <laughs> But, but yeah, that, I mean, you know, I like if it was, if it was, yeah, I would love it if that's what came about. Um, I would like to ask a question, but there's so many people who want to ask questions, so I will give them all first place. Uh, it's from Olga A, who writes, uh, "Plastics is actually a realization of our utopian fantasy to create something that is not degradable and dissolvable that separates us from nature." And now you uh, reject another fantasy to find a way to stop this previous realization of our insanity and instead even deepen it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that that's what I'm doing. Um, I totally agree with you, Olga, about um, about the uh, the first part that plastic is a realization of our utopian fantasy to create something that is not degradable and dissolvable that separates us from nature. I think what I was actually trying to say is sort of um, uh, is actually to well, first of all, to actually trace material the, the materiality of plastic to begin with, right? So I think that some sometimes we have these assumptions about what material is and what it does. Um, and um, you know the question of degradability and dissolvability is also one one that is inherently tied to plastics. But you know I've been studying plastic for a really long time, and one of the things about it is that it's actually a very unpredictable material. Um, sometimes it spontaneously dissolves. It can dissolve in waves. We're not entirely sure what happens. It probably means that all that carbon dioxide that is stored within it is also being re-released back into the atmosphere. That's another question that we need to seriously consider. Um, but I do think that. Um, I do think that it's maybe a mischaracterization to say that it is not degradable at all, right? And I think in part because I want to insist on, on that because I think that that we sometimes have this, this um, fantasy of our overarching ability as um, humans to be able to control things. And I think that, that um, ultimately we are really just one small part of nature and what, or whatever you want to call it, right? <laughs> um, and so, and so, actually, our control over things is quite limited. Um, and I think that that um, for me, that realization is actually deeply important in terms of our understanding of of our relationship to the world. Which isn't to say that we shouldn't be held accountable um, for um, for the kinds of deaths that are committed or the kinds of necropolitics um, that others have pointed to. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I wasn't trying to say that we we're supposed to um, deepen this um, this utopian fantasy of 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 undegradability or undissolvability. I think that actually, um, I was trying to sort of do the opposite. <laughs>
but I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. It was, it's kind of hard so for weird to have this sort of like no response because we're like typing here. <laughs> uh, uh, we have one kind of has a thought has a follow up uh, to his question before and he says that I think it's interesting to think about plastic also from the idea of plasticity as it is discussed by Catherine Malibu, this question of adaptability and entanglement between spirit, mind and body brain, but precisely in this line of thought is all plasticity good? In other words, is all adaptability by definition enhancing of earthly survival? Yeah, no, I don't think so. And actually um, in Malibu's thinking, she makes this distinction that I found really useful for my own thinking um, in relationship to questions of plasticity and elasticity. Um, and I would have to go back to my notes um, to totally get this right. But, but, um, but she, does, she does talk about what she calls a destructive plasticity, um, which is the way in which um, somebody is able to carry on after um, a kind of major brain lesion, for example, um, and, um, and the way in which they are not the same person, but they are expected to kind of be the same person. And she calls that a kind of destructive plasticity. Um, and I think that, um, I think that you're right. I think that part of the problem of plastic, part of the problem of the ways in which we've come to understand and think about plastic is that um, at least from a kind of Western point of view, we often think about plasticity is inherently a good thing. Um, and um, um, for a really amazing work on why this is definitively not the case, I would say um, Sakia Aman Jackson's recent book, um, Becoming Human is really essential um, to making an intervention in that um, because she talks about the ways in which um, how slavery operates Operated was precisely through this notion of plasticity, right? It's like it's like that um, that enslaved people were meant to be and were forced to be plastic, um, and it was through the complete non um, recognition or non um, the the way in which um, um, the slaveholders. Uh, were not uh, respectful of the boundaries of the human body um, that that slavery um, precedes so that blackness actually has this relationship, this kind of ontological, this product, produced ontological relationship to plasticity. Um, and that is um, both sort of sub and superhuman simultaneously. Um, I can't I can't do her work fully justice, but but that's a kind of brief, 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 um, brief, uh, pointing to, to some of the things that she's thinking about. And so, yeah, I do think that plasticity is not, is not always good. And I think that there's a way in which um, plasticity, that kind of violent plasticity um, is, is embedded in our relationships to matter and to the relationship of plastic as well, um, even if obviously with very different sort of political um, consequences. Uh, before we go any further, I have to remember that somebody asked you to write the names of the bacteria you mentioned into the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you don't have to try, to try to dig them all up. At some point? <laughs> Might be a lot. Yeah, and maybe that's to <laughs> ask of you. Uh, another person had asked uh, if you could share an inspiring bibliography, which uh, I was trying to find this note that's in the chat. Uh, could you please share a bibliography that you consider inspiring for your approach? Um, I would say, like, um, yeah, a lot of the the folks. Um, I can, I can, I can maybe put a few, a few things in the chat. You can also do this at the at the end. Perhaps. Yeah, I feel like maybe let's try to do this at the end. Yeah, I just want to make like sure it requires a lot of these things, there's a lot of things happening simultaneously here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have another um, a, a comment from Florine in the chat who writes, uh, can you perhaps expand a bit more on how toxicity binds us in novel ways with each other and with the other than human? Yeah, so I think that one of the things um, that lots of folks have written about in relationship um, to toxicity 
is that, um, you know, um, you know Stacey Alimo has written about it, this in relationship to the, the notion of transcorporeality. Um, Nancy Tuana has written about it in relationship to a concept called viscous porosity. Um, and what they're talking about there is the way in which um, we are literally composed of the kind of outside, right? So I think that that one of the things that toxicity really helps helps to articulate um, is is our entanglements with with um, with the more than human world, right? So that um, so that as much as we might want to keep something outside of ourselves, it is going to come inside of us, um, sort of no matter what we do. Um, and I think that. Um, you know, as I was talking about these these kinds of questions of the fantasies of barricades, I think that we, a lot of us enact this on a regular basis, right? Like, so, you know, one of the kind of very um, visceral ways of being able to think about this is that um, people have done studies of body burdens, um, which is the kind of um, chemical or toxic um, or metal, um, also related to heavy metals, load on the human body. Um, and and in the studies, you can actually tell what class somebody is based on the types of um, types of body burdens that they're carrying. So um, people who um, are in a lower socioeconomic um, position often are exposed to much more petrochemical toxins, um, including um, the toxins from plastics. You know, we all know this, right? Plastics are cheap, right? It's easy. It's like they're they're much. It's it's much cheaper to buy something out of plastic and than it is to buy out of other other types of materials. Um, and then, um, you know, and then the people on the higher socioeconomic spectrum um, tended to have uh, more uh, heavy metals in their bodies, and this was um, accounted for in relationship to um, uh, uh, the consumption of fish and other um, creatures that live in the sea. Um, obviously, this is a, that those are kind of gross generalizations. You'd want to, you know, modify this for for various kinds of cultural analysis and you know all of that kind of stuff. But I do think that um, that kind of understanding of people by way of their body burdens um, is um, is a real uh, indicator of how how, um, how toxicity binds us in the ways that you're putting. So to how toxicity binds us in all the ways to other than humans, um, like who we're eating and wh what kinds of environments we are inhabiting, um, but also, um, also our relations to each other and how we're differentiated along the lines of, lines of, of race and class, et cetera. Absolutely. There's another question um, in the in the chat that I'd like to read because it's quite. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. It's from uh, Keely Hafner, who writes, "I'm an artist. And my partner is an ecotoxicologist. We talk a lot about how non-plastic polymers exist in nature, but there are some chemicals which are truly novel and synthetic, requiring so much energy to produce that they can't live outside of human production." such as floral chemicals like Teflon. Mm. These chemicals could be said to migrate in different patterns. Teflon, for example, often ending up in the Arctic because of its molecular shape. Could you speak more about your interest in the acute materiality of plastic, perhaps less on a macro scale, like currents guiding plastics towards the Great Pacific uh, gear, or in terms of degradation, but in terms of the, quote, will of plastic on a microscopic scale? Could there be anything we can learn about the desires of plastic itself and by extension, <laughs> our own desires, thinking about it uh, in this way? Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful question. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so um, I guess what I would say is um, one of the things that's really central to plastic um, and to, and I guess maybe just to clarify. So when I say plastic, I mean, um, all of the, um, all of the molecular chains, all of the polymers that are fully synthetic, meaning derived from fossil fuels. So I'm not thinking about bioplastics, for example. Um, I'm also not thinking about the kinds of polymers um, that are um, that arise on their own. Um, so yeah, I am totally thinking about things like Teflon. Um, and um, and one of the things that, that that sort of unites that category of molecules, of which there are thousands, you know, as I'm sure you know, um, and and is is the fact that it's all hydrophobic. So one of the things I would say about it is that um, all of that stuff loves its 
its own kind. It's almost like you can, in some ways you can almost think about it as trying to, you know, like in the movies when like the bad guy gets like dispersed um, and then it, like it tries to reconstitute itself like in, uh, did that happen in, in um, what's the, anyway, whatever, sorry, <laughs> the, yeah, exactly like the blob or something, right? Like, you know, I feel like this happens in numerous, in numerous movies, but, um, but, um, but in any case, that, that I think that it likes to latch onto itself, right? So that's one of the things that we can learn about plastics. And that's one of the harms that it perpetuates is because it is um, a, um, a, a material that is based, that is fossil fuel derived and based um, in that kind of oily substance, it means that it's also um, a really good magnet for all of the other fossil fuel derived um, petrochemicals that are in, um, in the oceans, right? So part of the problem of plastics is that it really gloms on um, to, you know, um, flame retardants and um, other persistent organic pollutants that are found throughout the environment. Um, so I would say like on that kind of molecular level, what plastic likes or what plastic wants is its own kind. And what it really doesn't like is water. Um, and then beyond that, I think that's a great question. And I'm not, I don't, I don't know if I have any other thoughts at this time, but thank you. Well, that's really great. Um, one of the things that, I mean, we can probably end it soon since we're all over an hour, but I was thinking a lot uh, as in the run up to this sort of lecture about a, a little bit sort of on a macro level, but about how plastic sort of is sold to people as a reduction of labor um, and as a way of then like proliferating itself in the world. This is not very, it's not molecular and it's not really about queer kinship, but it's more about kind of a, um, yeah, it's sort of the perverse way that plastic is sort of like reproducing itself and also like oil is redistributing itself in this form in the world. And thinking just of like, you know, with the picture of your grandmother sort of like in the beginning, which is like sold as sort of liberation from the sort of domestic tasks of like washing the dishes or saying, you know, like, oh, you can just throw it away. And I know that, that this is sort of the mentality that I experience even within my own family, I'm horrified by it because this perpetual sort of, you know, yeah, like long living thing that's used one time and then sort of disposed of. Um, yeah, and just thinking this idea that, you know, we, at the same time, the futurity of heterosexual reproduction and yet this sort of very schizophrenic relationship to these <laughs> substances, which are then sort of making that reproduction difficult, um, yeah. Yeah, I think um like I think one of the other um advantages for me or one of the reasons why I was like interested um in uh in thinking about plastic along the lines of queer kin um is is actually to maybe try to reimagine what that labor could be, right? So that like so that it's not just a matter of this kind of like this labor that gets um put off it, it onto somebody or somewhere else, right? It's like, it's that if we actually had a kind of stronger bond to the materials that we are creating, that we couldn't just imagine that this, that, that, that this, um, that this labor just vanishes, right? Because it clearly doesn't, right? Like, you know, either what happens is that plastic, um, in the case of recycling, often that plastic, you know, just ends up um, in another place in the world at this point in time, often in Indonesia, um, before it was in China until they very wisely decided that they were not going to take the, the West waste anymore. Um, but, um, but now it often ends up in Indonesia where people um, are really forced to actually go through it by hand. Like this recycling, I think we sometimes imagine as this like machinic process and it is not, it is an extremely manual process um, and has extremely real consequences for, for the bodies of the workers who are forced to kind of sift through all of this stuff. And you're precisely right that the plastics was sold to um, everybody, I think, in the world, um, as this like as this way of of being free from certain kinds of domestic 
um, attachments, but I also, th also think it, it is really a way, um, and maybe this is um, back to um, the question, I'm not sure if I totally did it justice, but the, the question about this kind of disconnection from the earth is that like, is that it is this, this um, it is this way in which we can have this fantasy of a kind of disconnection from the earth, right? It is this way in which we can perpetuate a fantasy uh, that, that there is some kind of a way that plastic goes to, but also that um, that um, that this that that the these relations of care and repair and all of that stuff is something that's undesirable, right? It's like how did we get to a place at which those things are un undesirable? And I wonder if like um, you know, yeah, like reorienting ourselves to certain kinds of practices of repair. Um, is maybe in some ways more fulfilling not to not to not to also discount the the very real labor involved in that and the extremely hard work and the long long hours and the, the drudgery and you know all of that stuff I understand why people like it but it's like um but I also wonder if there's like maybe some deeper relations and commitments that we're missing out on that could also be fulfilling mm. mm -hmm. absolutely uh, is there anyone else who would like to say something or have a burning question? Now would be the moment. <laughs> I feel like I might also just be ranting at this point anyway. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful questions. I mean, I have to say like, yeah, it's like really such a, such a stellar set of questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Somebody mentioned uh, Sarah Gabot, who's working on the futurity of plastics. I'm wondering if you know of her work. I don't know if that person I know. I will look look them up. Thank you for the. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I mean, I don't want to drag on our discussion too long, but uh, I was just wrote wrote a lecture where I was writing about oil, sort of as something that has. Um, separated sort of humans tempor temporarily, not temporarily, in temporality from the rest of the world. And I think plastic does that, of course, obviously together with oil um, mm -hmm. and in all of its convenience. And um, while it has definitely improved the quality of life for many people, um, it's also <laughs> having a very negative um, impact, let's say, or long-lived um, yeah, exactly. Like, and I think sometimes it's also a matter of like, I think that's what I really like about the kind of Lee Edelman stuff too, is like, I think it also helps to make clear the fact that it's like, you know, or this, these kinds of critiques that come from people like Rebecca Sheldon, um, about, um, about reproductive futurity and relationships, to the environmental movement. It's like, it's like, we actually don't want this. Like, I think that, um, that in order to kind of be, um, and the kind of notion of sustainability, right, is like sustainability betrays the fact that what it's sort of asking for is something to sustain. And I think that actually what we need at this moment is something quite radically different, right? And so it's like, yeah, maybe things kind of looked better under certain guises for some people for some time, but it's like how the kind of, um, the kind of um, ongoing violence of that or the subtending violence of that, I think is something that cannot actually be sustained, nor do we want it to be, or nor do I want it to be. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. I just have one last question. No one has anything else, but do you know what the, like when these microbes are like sort of digesting this plastic, like what is, what are they producing? Cause it doesn't really disappear. Do you know? No, I'm not, you know, this is a really good question. I'm not 100% sure. I actually had some mealworms that um, ate some styrofoam in my house um, that lived with me for a really long time. And they like went through like a, a whole reproductive cycle. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, oh, it's so nice to see so many friends on here. Um, thank you guys, Regina and, and, and Chris. And also I saw Susan, she please was here for a second and then she left. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 like from the from the scientific articles that I've read, it, it's like it's funny because people don't seem to be that interested in it. They just say that they metabolize it, 
Um, but precisely what it gets metabolized into is unclear to me. I mean, I guess they, they poo and, and then that's something, you know, but like precisely what it is, this is also a question that I have that I have not been able to find out the answer to. So if I, if I find it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting answer. Alcohol, Keyless is alcohol. Oh, interesting. Oh, oh that's great. Oh, okay, great. excellent. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Great. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that's very yeah. helpful. It's a kind of fermentation process. Oh, everybody knows except for me. Oh, Gosh, I should really know this, huh? <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Juan and Keely. I really appreciate this. <laughs> okay great i will <laughs> that would explain the funny smells that started coming from that box of, <laughs> of mealworms <laughs> oh, it's very interesting but like yeah these sort of microbes that are eating plastic they don't know if they should eat good you know like the good plastic or our waste product plastic so I you know, know right to... I mean there, there was like this hilarious um like 1960s um science fiction novel called mutant 74 or 94 I can't remember it was something for um that um where the fantasy was that this 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 plastic this plastic eating bacteria got released into the world and then you know planes started falling from the sky and everyone was naked and um, you know, all of our infrastructure fell apart. <laughs> so, so, but you know, at, at least so far, these bacteria are not that effective. Yeah. You can only eat so much at a time. <laughs> Great. Uh, so it's eight thirty, and that was a pretty wonderful talk. Um, do you have anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? No, just um, thanks everyone for your generosity and for sticking around and for asking such great questions and being such amazing interlocutors.